Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to our Electrify Everything Meetup. I'm Fabrice Florin, Director of Green Change, our Bay Area Climate Action Network. We are honored that so many of you are joining us for this community meetup about electrification from all over the Bay Area, California, Oregon, and beyond. Tonight, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers who will tell us about the many ways we can power our lives with clean energy. And we are grateful to the Green Change team for making this event possible and to all the partners who support our work. Uh, here's our agenda for tonight's meetup. We'll feature seven lightning talks on a wide range of topics and have a Q&A at the end of the hour followed by a community green tips. Uh, our Zoom rules for this uh, meetup are simple. Uh, please mute your microphone, ask uh, questions in text chat where we'll be sharing links as well. And we will email you the event video and the links in a few days. So Green Change is a climate action network in the San Francisco Bay Area where we help each other live sustainably and fight climate change. We serve a growing community of thousands of concerned citizens like you in California and beyond. Each year, we organize four quarterly campaigns along with our partners, um, Regeneration, Earth 2050, Electrify Everything, which we're running now, and uh, Climate Politics, where we're gonna invite you to help save democracy in the fall. And each of our campaigns kicks off with a public event like this one. And we also produce online content, including guides and green tips on climate actions, uh, such as uh, using clean energy and transportation and uh, eating sustainably, living lightly. So uh, we invite you to take action with us and join our future events, which we'll tell you more at the end of this meetup. But tonight, uh, the theme of this event is electrify everything. We're going to learn how to use clean electricity, electrify our rides, and electrify our homes. Our speakers will talk about the many ways that we can stop burning fossil fuels for energy, which is the leading cause of climate change. They're going to tell us how to switch to clean electricity, how to replace our gas-guzzling cars with electric vehicles, and replace our natural gas appliances with clean appliances. So tonight we will learn how to electrify everything by using clean energy in our daily lives to save money, to save our health and the planet. We'll hear about a range of actions we can take to protect our future, use renewable electricity, get an electric car or an e-bike, and use heat pumps to heat your water uh, and your home. And here's uh, Brian right there with his heat pump. Um, so we invite you to uh, use clean energy at every step of the way and check out our clean energy action guides, which are linked in text chat. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers who are going to talk on a variety of topics. Uh, Brian Stewart from Electrify Now will talk about the benefits of electrification. Sebastian Cohn from MCE will talk about clean electricity rates and rebates. Annika Osborne from Ride and Drive Clean is gonna tell us how to get an EV or e-bike that's right for you. Mark Shabria from Marin County Sustainability Team will tell us how to electrify your home. Sean Armstrong from Redwood Energy will tell us about heat pumps for everyone. Susan Gladwin from Ready, Set, Replace will tell us about ways you can plan ahead to electrify your water heating. And David Moeller from the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad is going to help us pass an all electric ordinance and will uh, we'll tell you how you can uh, convince your city to do that. Together, they're gonna show us how we can power our lives with clean energy by replacing harmful gas powered appliances and vehicles with safe electric products that are cheaper to use, better for your health, and that can save the planet. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Brian Stewart, co-founder of Electrify Now, 
who will tell us about the benefits of electrification. Brian has over 30 years of experience in design, manufacturing, innovation, and sustainability. He held various senior leadership roles at Nike, including vice president of sustainable innovation. He and his wife, Perrin, founded Electrify Now in 2018 to help accelerate the transition to clean, renewable energy. Brian, take it away. All right, thank you, Fabrice, and hello, everyone. Um, really glad to be here tonight. We've got a great lineup of speakers, and I feel like I, I'm my job here is to maybe just kind of tee up things at a pretty high level, and then uh, the, the things that come to follow will really sort of pay off, I think, what I'm talking about. But it, my wife and I started Electra right now about four years ago because we were frustrated at basically how bad the information was available to normal people about the really powerful things that we can do to fight climate change. And so I've spent the last four years really heavily researching this and trying to make it as simple as possible for people to understand all these amazingly optimistic things that are happening there. So hopefully tonight uh, you'll find this helpful. I like to start at the very highest level, which is where do carbon emissions even come from? I mean, when I started this, I wasn't even really very clear of this, even though I'd been working in sustainability for many, many years. And the truth is that the short story is that Pretty much all the carbon emissions that are causing the problems that we're facing come from burning fossil fuels for energy, as Fabrice said. And it's energy that we use for electricity, transportation, and heat. And this is the information for the United States here specifically, but I've looked at Germany, Japan, France, it all looks, all the industrialized nations look very similar. And even the agrarian societies or countries might have a slightly hard, larger uh, share of their emissions that come from agriculture, but for the most part, it's gonna look very similar to this. Almost all of the emissions come from energy. At the household level, it's a very similar picture. About 60% of the emissions that we're responsible for as individuals comes from the energy that we consume and specifically think about it as the energy you purchase. Think of it this way, as the, your electric bill, your, the gas that you buy to put in your car and your natural gas that you pay for if you're using that to heat your home. Those three things will account for about 60% of your carbon emissions. And then of course, there's a lot of energy involved in the stuff we buy, the products we, we purchase and the food that we buy and eat. And, but it's harder to reduce those. I mean, there are some things you can do and I know Green Change does a good job of giving advice about that. You can buy um, fewer things and use them for longer and, and uh, you know, shop locally for your food and, and re buy regeneratively raised agricultural products if you can. And you can chip away at these two boxes on the right, but this big gray box of 60%, it's entirely possible to completely eliminate that in all of our lives. We've done it in our home. We've helped a lot of people do it around the world, around the country, in Oregon, in the, primarily, and I'm sure a lot of people on this call have done these things as well. So we're gonna talk more about that. But the reason that these energy is such a problem is because we burn coal and natural gas for electricity primarily, although that's changing, as you know. Um, gasoline and diesel powers our transportation. And by the way, it's primarily cars and trucks that are the problem. Yes, airplane travel should be avoided yes. when possible, and, but really it's cars and trucks that are the, the vast majority of emissions come from there. And then to heat our homes, we primarily, or, or about half the, the uh, buildings in the United States are heated with natural gas and to some degree propane. So the bad news is that we have to get rid, we have to stop burning these fossil fuels. Don't just, it's not, our mindset has to be about eliminating them, not just reducing them. Reducing is good, obviously, but we have to be in the mindset of eliminating fossil fuels from our lives in terms of the combustion of them. The good news though, is that wind and solar are now the cheapest way to produce energy. Um, it, this is true in most parts of the world and it's quickly becoming true everywhere. You can see these two white lines here are wind and solar, and you can see how the price per megawatt hour has just plummeted in the last 20 years, and it's projected to go even lower, um, whereas, I mean, uh, we've been seeing a lot of price increases with gas and, and coal and those, those products, which is likely to be the case. So, wind and solar are now very cheap. They're very ubiquitous. They ha wind and solar hits every part of the world, literally. And the other thing that's happening that's similar to this is battery prices are also plummeting along essentially the same curve. 
The other exciting thing that's happened is that in the last decades, electric appliances have become dramatically more efficient. This is the, the LED light bulb is kind of the poster child for this, which is literally 10 times more energy efficient than an incandescent bulb. But our refrigerators, our, our laptops, our phones, our TVs, everything that uses electricity is sipping it now where it was guzzling it years ago. And the grid is getting cleaner literally every day as some, you know, think of it this way. Anytime someone puts a new rooftop solar on or a new wind farm gets tilted up, the grid gets cleaner. This is the trajectory over the last 20 years for electricity generation in the United States. And you can see emissions just continue to go down and will continue to do that as states have these renewable energy portfolios. That's driving that corporate um, investments in clean power and personal investments, which is something we'll talk about in a minute. The grid's getting cleaner, electric appliances are getting efficient and more efficient every day. And so the combination is what le leads us to this idea of electrifying everything where essentially all of our primary energy needs will be coming from the wind and the sun. Yes, we'll need other sources. Hydro, for sure here in the Northwest, that's a big thing. Maybe even nuclear, who knows? I mean, but the, the point is that we won't be using fossil fuels for energy because wind and sun, and sun will be um, primarily our energy sources. There's amazing co-benefits from this, you know, cleaner air. Think about it. Where does air pollution come from? It comes from burning fossil fuels primarily. We'll have cleaner water. It's unbelievable how much clean water is wasted to produce fossil fuels, to extract it from the ground and, and process it. It's huge percentage. I've seen estimates from 10 to as high as 30% of national clean water supply used for energy creation with uh, fossil fuels. We'll have better jobs. We'll get people out of the coal mines and doing, setting up solar panels and other uh, important work. And a stronger economy. There's tons of research that shows that transitioning to a green economy is, is good for everyone in terms of jobs. And then we're seeing right now with Ukraine how unequal access to energy can real, create huge problems in terms of the stability of the planet. And so this equal access to energy is something that's, that's real with um, renewables. But I don't want to, so it's very optimistic, but we can't sugarcoat this stark reality that between now and 2050, literally for us to hit the targets that we're aiming for of being net zero by 2050, Literally every single device that burns fossil fuels has to be eliminated or replaced with something that's using clean energy by 2050. That's you know, a little less than 30 years to do this. The bad news is it's thousands, literally thousands of coal plants and uh, gas power plants. Tens of millions of cars and trucks need to be converted. Millions of gas furnaces and water heaters need to be converted. But on the other hand, you know, in the 30 years that we have, or roughly speaking, most of the things that are currently in use will naturally retire. They will have reached the end of their useful lives. So it's really important that when that opportunity presents itself to replace something that's naturally being retired, that we re replace it with a clean energy solution. And the great news is that we have incredibly potent solutions that are here today. Yes, there will be new developments that will make it even more exciting and, and probably lower cost and more effective. But the ones we have today are insanely powerful. We have wind and solar, like we mentioned, which are the lowest cost, cost way to provide heat. We have electric vehicles that are beginning to, you know, the latest reports are that electric vehicles are like booming while the gas car sales are declining. People say that we reached peak gas car sales in 2017. So electric vehicles for personal use and also for, for um, uh, hauling products, medium range and long range trucking, and then electric heat pumps for heating buildings, whether they're commercial buildings or our homes. These things are incredibly effective and they're right here. And when we can combine renewable energy with electrification, we don't just reduce emissions, we eliminate them. And some of the easiest way to see this is in our own homes, where these are the four top sources of emissions in most people's homes. It's the electricity we purchase, three to five tons a year. One gas car is four to eight tons. A furnace is about the same. Gas water heater, one to three tons. If we employ efficiency strategies, which are good to do, but it, really, if you, you know, turn the lights off whenever you can, get a fuel efficient car, turn down your thermostat, take cold showers, 
you may reduce your emissions by 20% or so, which would be helpful, there's no doubt. But compare that to renewable energy and electrification strategies where we get electricity that's renewable to begin with, we charge our EVs with that, zero emissions from electricity and transportation now. Use ele clean electricity for our heat pumps, now it's zero emissions for heating and cooling our homes and same with water heating. So a typical home would normally be 20 to 30 tons of, of carbon emissions per year. It can be zero with these strategies. And as Fabrice said, we can save money. I mean, on at rough numbers, you know, converting to these solutions will save most home owners about $3,000 per year. Most of that comes from EVs, by the way, but depending on where you live here in Oregon, um, heat pumps are actually cheaper to operate than gas furnaces and gas water heaters. Not the same everywhere. I don't believe that's the same necessarily in California. But when you, when you do this whole package, get off fossil fuels, you will save money. No doubt about it. So that's why this is so exciting. We can live in homes that are safer and more comfortable because that air pollution we were talking about is indoors as well as outdoors. So you'll be healthier by um, getting rid of those gas burning devices, particularly the ones that um, you burn indoors. And we'll be spending our money on the solution rather than the problem. Think about it that way. Every time, typical $4,000 per year we spend on energy. Currently, if you're spending fossil fuel, buying fossil fuels, that's basically funding climate change. But with these actions, you can spend your money on the solution instead. So the question that I would like to ask all of you and that all of us should be asking ourselves is, what can we as individuals do to make these solutions, which are so insanely powerful, the new normal? Because they're not right now. That's the challenge we have is how do we scale these as quickly as possible? All these things have relatively low market share, but the actions of people like us who care about this, who are early adopters, if you want to think of yourself that way, really help to change the market and show our neighbors that this is not only possible, but it's awesome. So we try to make it really easy by taking these steps, clean up your electric supply, electrify your home, electrify your ride. And then we have to make sure we bring everyone with us. You'll be hearing more detail about each of these topics tonight from our other speakers. It's important that this electrify everyone, we can't forget that there are people who will have trouble making this transition and we need to help them whenever we can. There's tons of information on our website about this. We have a newsletter. If you're interested, you could sign up and we have lots of webinars on specific topics that where we go deep on each one of these things. All that's available on our YouTube channel. I think the link is in the chat. So that's it from, from me. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. And I'll be here at the end to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. We really appreciate all the good work that you and your team uh, do at Electrify Now to keep us informed on how to electrify our lives. Everyone, if you have a question for Brian, please type it in text chat where he will respond shortly. I also invite you to sign up for their webinar on heat pump water heaters tomorrow at 12 o'clock, right about lunchtime. The link is in text chat as well. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Sebastian Cohn from um, uh, MCE. Uh, is a community development manager at what used to be called Marin Clean Energy, California's first community choice aggregation program. He manages partnerships with local government staff, community organizations, and business <coughs> groups in Marin and Solano counties. He works on programs related to energy efficiency, resiliency, sustainability, to help MCE's member communities reduce energy-related greenhouse gas emissions. Sebastian is going to tell us about renewable electricity, time of use rates, and electrification incentives. Take it away, Sebastian. Yeah, thanks so much, Fabrice. And uh, thank you to Bridget for doing a shout out for MCE's 100% renewable option, Deep Green, in the chat there. That's that's very nice of you. Um, so yeah, as Fabrice said, my name is Sebastian Kahn. I'm a community development manager at MCE. And I think Brian's slide deck to start the presentation here tonight uh, really kicks things off well to talk about time of use transition um, and how we all can save money on our electric bills and help overall electric reliability throughout the state at the same time. So next slide. So you've probably been hearing on, uh, on TV, radio, or wherever you get your news about conserving power from 4 to 9 p.m. 
And that's because earlier this year, most residential customers in the state of California were transitioned to a time of use rate plan. Uh, and that's part of a statewide initiative to ensure greater power reliability. Next slide, please. So time of use rates, what is time of use? How does this apply to you as an electric customer? Time of use pricing is an electric rate schedule and it adjusts the price of your electricity at your home based on when you're using power. So now when you're using power is as important as how much you're using. And this audience might be familiar, but for those of us that are not, um, the cost of electricity varies throughout the day. During hours of high energy usage, typically from 4 to 9 p.m., when most folks are getting home from work, they're turning on their appliances, they're cooking dinner, uh, the cost of electricity is much more high because it's more expensive to generate and deliver that power to customers. And so time of use process, uh, pricing is intended to encourage you to use electricity during times of the day when power is cheaper and demand is lower. And that helps alleviate strain on the electric grid. So let's say, for example, uh, it's a hot summer night, everyone across the state is getting home and they're cranking up their air conditioners uh, at six or 7 p.m. Uh, that can be really problematic because from the standpoint of the electric grid, demand can be greater than supply. And so time of use, what we're talking about this evening is all about addressing that issue and also giving electric customers more control to avoid energy surcharges during those peak time periods when demand is high between 4 to 9 p.m. Uh, next slide. So with time of use, we're not only helping the stability and reliability of the electric grid, but customers can actually save money in the process too. So in fact, over 75% of MCE customers are expected to save on a time of use rate. And it really can be simple fixes, running appliances like your washer and dryer during lower price off peak hours, let's say 10 a.m. as opposed to 6 a.m. is a simple way to start reducing your electricity bill. And again, that's because energy is cheaper for the consumer during off peak hours. Um, and I wanted to actually give Wesley Alden a shout out here. She, she puts this really well on her Drawdown Bay Area website. Um, if you haven't visited, go check it out. But really another easy way to impact your electric bill and uh, help with this time of use transition is try to practice water conservation as well from 4 to 9 p.m. Pumping water uses a lot of energy and you can do simple things at your home like turning off running water. I'm sure all of us are doing that already. Um, but also use water saving faucet aerators and do most of your laundry on the cold cycle. Really simple things that can not only save water but can also save uh, money on your electric bill each month. Um, next slide, please. And so while we're talking about saving money, I do want to talk about uh, our bill assistance programs. Um, you know, we know at MCE that falling behind on your energy bill can be stressful, and MCE wants to help with that too. There are several resources that are available to folks uh, that are MCE customers. Um, that's if you live in Marin, Solano, Napa, or Contra Costa County. You can visit mcecleanenergy.org slash lower bill. And we have a number of different resources available, including monthly discount programs, debt forgiveness programs, and alternative, rate, alternative rates for those that have uh, medical equipment. Uh, next slide. And this is transitioning just a little bit, but as we're talking about the ways in which we use energy, uh, I think it would be silly to not mention electric vehicle charging. Um, and I don't want to steal ride and drive clean thunder. I know Annika is presenting next year uh, and you'll hear more about electric vehicles. But, um, you know, as we're talking about ways in which customers use energy, electric vehicle charging is really important. Um, and if you live in a multifamily property or you commute to work uh, each day, MCE has a program that helps install EV charging at your housing, pro at housing properties and workplaces. Uh, Participants. Oh, can some background noise? But yeah, that? folks can um, get up to a $3,500 rebate through MCE to install EV charging. And if you live in Marin County, that can actually be coupled with the Transportation Authority of Marin's rebates, uh, which is super helpful and, and can help really offset the cost of new EV charging infrastructure. Next slide. Yeah, and I know this is a, a kind of a rapid fire event tonight. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll also be around for Q&A at the end. But 
hopefully I filled you in a little bit about time of use and some of the available programs we have at MCE. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. Really appreciate this. And if you have a question for him, type it in text chat and he'll re respond uh, as best as he can. Um, our next speaker is Annika Osborne, Community Outreach and Program Director for Cool the Earth, where she engages with partners and the community on the Ride and Drive Clean campaign to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. She also serves on the board of Sustainable San Rafael to advance climate mitigation solutions in her city. And in her free time, Etika enjoys hiking the hills and beaches of Marin with a family and dog, Indigo. Etika is going to give us an overview on how to electrify your ride with EVs and e-bikes, how to find the right electric vehicle for you, and how to transition to clean transportation. Take it away, Etika. Thank you so much, Fabrice. Uh, yes, I'm Annika Osborne uh, with Cool the Earth. And I first wanted to say that at Cool the Earth, we believe that walking, biking, taking public transportation and carpooling, preferably in electric cars, are the best transportation options. And with our Ride and Drive Clean collaboration, we focus on educating and engaging people around zero emissions vehicles like electric cars and e-bikes because the rapid increase of electric vehicles will improve air quality and slow global warming. Uh, thanks again, uh, Fabrice and the green team, uh, green change team for having me here um, tonight. Next. So there are many benefits to driving electric. So let's go back to blue skies and the clean air that we experienced two years ago when we stopped driving. In the Bay Area, our passenger vehicles are the single largest source of GHG emissions, representing up to 50% of our individual carbon footprint. So when we switch from a gas car to an EV or e-bike and plug into clean energy like we can here in the Bay Area, we're taking impactful climate action by reducing carbon emissions and air pollution, both which disproportionately impact equity priority communities. And besides saving the planet, you can save time, money, and improve your driving experience because it's just a little more fun to drive electric. So we know that the cost, cost is one of the biggest barriers to driving electric. And although early EV drivers paid a high premium for electric cars, today's EV drivers often save money. According to a February 2022 study, the total lifetime cost of ownership of an EV is about $4,700 less than that of a comparable gas car. And note that in February 2022, gas prices hadn't gone up yet. So significant difference even since then. Uh, some of the reasons for the low cost of driving uh, electric are that there are incentives available for up to $10,250 when you purchase or lease a new EV, and more if your income qualifies, including the MCE EV rebate. Um, fueling a gas car can be two to five times more expensive than fueling an EV, and because EVs have fewer than 20 moving parts, maintenance costs are 40% lower for EVs. Next. So there are over 30 100% battery electric vehicles on the market today, including trucks, starting at $26,500, that Chevy Bolt, uh, and close to 40 plug-in hybrids with a smaller range battery and a gas tank. Uh, and most models are available on the used market at a fraction of the cost. So next. If you're not in the market for an EV, an e-bike might be just right for you. So instead of hopping in a gas car, you can reduce emissions by commuting and running errands with an e-bike. E-bikes are fast and fun, and there are so many different models to choose from. Next. So people get worried about charging, but for many people, 90% of charging is done at home or at work. At home, you can simply plug into a standard 120-volt outlet to replenish the electricity that you use during the day. You can also install a level two charging station at home. And charging on the road is getting easier all the time. Thousands of public charging sites provide super fast level three charging and more chargers are on the way with Biden's infrastructure bill that was passed last year. Um, so once you start driving electric, it's ideal to charge your EV from rooftop solar. There's a federal tax credit available this year for 26% of the install cost. It's a great feeling to charge your car from the electricity that is generated from your own roof. If you're not ready for solar, you can choose a clean energy plan from your utility or CCA like 
MCE clean energy. So you're charging your EV with clean renewable energy from the sun and wind. And in addition, your utility or CCA may offer a special reduced EV time of use rate. So you pay less for electricity during certain times of the day. In the MCE service area, that's from midnight to 3 p.m. So you have a long time to uh, charge with really affordable rates. Um, and finally, Ride and Drive Clean is here to help you go electric. I invite you to join us for a one hour weekly Zoom webinar, always with Q&A. Uh, join us for an EV and e-bike show where you can check out a variety of EVs all in one place. We're planning several shows this summer and fall and you'll find them on our events page. Uh, check out the Ride and Drive Clean website with buying and driving guides, FAQs, calendar of events and more. And save big with our EV discount campaign, which we plan to offer in Q1 2023. We really need to get off fossil fuels as soon as possible. I hope you'll pledge to make your next car electric and sign up with the Ride and Drive with Ride and Drive Clean so that you can go electric. Uh, I'm going to drop a link in the chat, or maybe somebody else is going to do that for me. Uh, so you'll have the opportunity to pledge to make your next car electric and sign up for updates about all things EV. Thanks again, Fabrice and the Green Change team. Thank you so much, Annika. I really appreciate all this great information. And by the way, we sold our second gas guzzling car. Uh, and I, I, I now use my e-bike for most everything, including getting the groceries. I can get up to six uh, grocery bags on my e-bike, believe it or not. That's great, Fabrice. Yeah. All right. Well, our next speaker is Mark Shabria, who is program coordinator for the County of Marin sustainability team. He coordinates Electrify Marin, a rebate program uh, that uh, lets you uh, get gas to electric appliance replacement. Uh, and it was started in 2019. I'm going to stop sharing now. Well, there we go. He's doing it. Yeah. And uh, he's going to give us an overview on how to electrify your home with clean appliances from heat pumps to induction cooked up and tell us about rebates you can get from local governments. Take it away, Mark. Awesome, thank you so much Fabrice and thanks everybody for coming. I'm Mark Chabria, I work for the County of Marin sustainability team. And as Fabrice said, I coordinate a rebate program called Electrify Marin, which offers incentives for gas to electric appliance upgrades for homeowners in Marin County. Um, so I wanted to share this pie chart of the countywide greenhouse gas emissions from our 2019 greenhouse gas emission inventory, um, just to really uh, sort of reiterate that um, as Annika just shared with us, we know that the biggest source of emissions countywide is transportation. Um, here in Marin County, that means passenger vehicles for the most part. But really, we've got a, a pretty big second second piece here, which is uh, from burning natural gas in our built environment. And so Electrify Marin was started in 2019 to shrink this piece of the pie um, by providing some incentives to homeowners to transition away from fossil fuels in their homes. Um, and of course, uh, Marin's built environment mostly consists of homes. So how are we using fossil fuels in our homes? So the pie, this chart represents the typical California home, and yours might be a little bit different, but most of us use natural gas or propane for space heating, water heating, and cooking. Um, and there are some miscellaneous smaller uses as well. Um, but when we put together the rebate program, we made rebates available for replacing gas furnaces, gas water heaters and gas cooking appliances, because really those are the biggest opportunities for greenhouse gas reduction. Also, uh, there are fantastic efficient electric alternatives available for those appliances. Um, and I'll talk just a little bit about those now. Um, so first looking at heat pump space heating, you can see in the diagrams um, that there are some, you know, several different ways that these systems can be configured. Um, they can use your existing ducts from your central furnace or their ductless configurations. But what they really all have in common is that instead of producing heat through combustion or an electric resistance element, they move heat from one place to another uh, using refrigerant. And so moving heat 
Uh, it requires vastly less energy than producing heat. So these systems are extremely efficient. Um, in the winter, they can move heat from the outdoors in. Uh, in the summer, from the indoors out. So they also function as air conditioning, which is, is fantastic this time of year. Um, standard rebate that's available for from Electrify Marin for a central ducted heat pump system is $1,000. Th and that can be stacked on top of other rebates that are available regionally um, from the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. And there are other sources of rebates as well. Um, there is a statewide California that's currently not active, but but should be coming back sometime soon. Um, so good good to always keep an eye out on the the uh, changing rebate landscape. Um, so next, uh, heat pump water heaters. They use the same technology to move heat from the surrounding air into the water storage tanks. And, and you can see that these look very much like a gas storage tank water heater, but the heat pump mechanism sits on top. Um, there are some little differences to consider around installation. They require some open space around them for ventilation. Um, they will slightly cool the space that they're operating in um, because remember, they're moving heat from that space into the storage tank. Um, and they're often a little bit taller also than their gas counterparts because that heat pump mechanism is sitting on top. Um, but really, heat pump water heaters are an amazing opportunity to reduce dramatically reduce your home's carbon footprint because there are multiple rebates available. It's a lower project, lower cost project than replacing your furnace. Usually um, we saw that in the typical California home, it's about 43% of your fossil fuel use. Um, so you can get a standard rebate of $1,000 from Electrify Marin plus $1,000 from the Bay Area Regional Energy Network. Um, stacking, stacking those rebates really helps a lot with a good chunk of the project cost. Um, so finally, uh, moving into induction cooking here, and, and it's kind of the most fun of these great efficient electric technologies because it's the one we interact with most. Uh, it's a completely different approach to cooking in that there's no flame, no heat produced with an electric existence resistance element, um, induction cooktops use an electromagnetic current to stimulate the iron molecules directly in our pots and pans and uh, some hot um, uses less energy again, and it doesn't heat up our kitchens on a hot day like today. Uh, probably not, not a lot of us are cooking tonight. Um, also results in faster cooking times. It, it, they give uh, chefs more precision. And really most importantly, um, you know, it, they enable us to avoid some of the really harmful byproducts that are created by cooking with gas, um, like carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide, which are linked to asthma. We really shouldn't be breathing those things in and, and either should our small humans or pets or whoever else is running around our home. Um, so the rebates are really fantastic on these as well. Uh, $500 on an induction range from Electrify Marin and $300 from Bayren can be stuck, stacked on top of that. If you look online at induction ranges, you'll see them listed for like $1,100, $1,200. So um, the $800 rebate is huge. Installation is really simple and easy and doesn't usually require a permit. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, seamless process to switch over uh, for the most part. Um, so just a couple things to wrap up here. People call me a lot and they ask where to begin with getting away from fossil fuels. And, and I really tell people to first think about which appliances in their home are using gas and, and to think about the age of those appliances as well. So it's really, really hard to make an intentional and well-researched decision when you're in an emergency, right? But if your water heater is 15 years old and it's reaching the end of its useful life, you can make a replacement plan now um, so that you don't make the wrong decision when you have like a house full of people screaming at you because they can't take a hot shower. And Susan's gonna expand on that scenario a little bit more. Um, but I also tell people that shopping around can really pay off. You know, home upgrades are really, really expensive in the Bay Area. Um, and being willing to, you know, endure a, a large number of estimates from really from a range of larger and smaller HVAC contractors and plumbing contractors um, can result in some huge savings. 
Um, and then so finally, I just posted a couple of resources that I wanted to share. The Switches On is a great resource for um, electrification generally, which has some listings of all the available rebates that would be available to you based on your zip code. Um, and there's a contractor directory there as well. The Electrify Marin webpage has some great local resources. Um, and also I have all my contact information listed and uh, we're always happy to hear from you at the sustainability team. So I'm gonna pass it back to Fabrice and uh, we'll be looking for questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, I'm pleased to say that I'm the proud owner of an electric heat pump uh, water heater, the one that you saw in, uh, in Mark's slides, and that we received the $1,000 rebate from the County of Marin, which is wonderful. And I just learned today that I can still apply to Bayran and stack up that uh, uh, rebate. So uh, thank you uh, for making this possible and helping uh, 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 homeowners like us uh, improve our uh, homes uh, for the greater good. Um, our next speaker is Sean Armstrong, who's managing principal of Redwood Energy, who's worked uh, for 25 years in building electrification, designed the retrofit and new construction of more than 10,000 all electric residences for disadvantaged populations. And he's co-authored five practical guides to building electrification. We're sharing a link to one of them in text chat and provided legal and tech support to dozens of gas bands nationwide. He's gonna talk about electric heat pumps, how you can use them to heat your water or to heat cool your space, how to find the right heat pump for you, and how to get it installed economically, especially if you're a renter or low income household. Take it away, Sean. Hey, thanks y'all. <clears throat> okay, so just quickly, if you see behind me, this is an electric fireplace, just cause it's fun to, it's pretty to look at. It's using ultrasound to make mist, which is lit up with lights. Extremely realistic. Heat pumps for all. First, I'm just going to point out that ordinances have made a big difference. Uh, ordinances started in Zurich in Switzerland in 2011 to ban gas. And you can see on the left all the different countries that have banned, and essentially therefore required heat pumps. And you're seeing the same thing here in California where we have more than 56 cities and Los Angeles passed a unanimous ordinance to do it this year, but they haven't actually said what they're going to do. So starting off with least cost. If you're a renter, if you have a low budget, for $600, this is the best heat pump. This Medea Duo, 600 bucks on Amazon. Oh, so you can get it at Lowe's, et cetera. It's an online, it's 80 pounds when it shows up, and this has an inverter, so it's a quiet heat pump. On the right-hand side is the Hair, which is sort of like the second best, and it doesn't have an inverter, so it's noisier, and it doesn't have a lot of other nicer features. Um, and Brian put in the chat towards the top our whole webinar on how to do portable heat pumps, but this is the best one. One of these is good for say a 750 square foot space. Two of them would be more than enough for a 1500 square foot house generally. They just produce heat where they are and they need a window that opens and closes up and down in order to fit the little kit. Next in price. Uh, these are the hotel types and LG currently is making one that's the perfect one, which also has an inverter. Inverters are computers. And you can see how the computer here is allowing this to be quieter. See the green versus the red noise that's being made by a standard heat pump? The computer is allowing it to shut down all the parts that are noisy and just run it at a low speed, a quiet speed. Most heat pumps, old style, are just on or off, like you're 70 miles an hour down the road or you're going nowhere. And this is an accelerator that you can choose your speed and therefore it controls noise. So getting an inverter heat pump is important for efficiency, for noise, et cetera. These are real popular now in affordable housing and in small single family homes. This is a wall mounted heat pump, $2,300 plus installation, and it just hangs on the wall. So you cut two holes through the wall, two six inch or eight inch duct holes, and you pull the air in and then exhaust it out. So instead of cutting a hole through the whole wall, like you do with the hotel type, that's that the box is the dimensions of the hole. In this case, you hang it on the wall and you cut a couple of holes into it. Super efficient, got the computer in it. Super, yeah, cold climate, negative five Fahrenheit performance. Now these are just about to come out, the gradients, and they've been worked on for years. And this is a window heat pump, sort of like the portable I showed you here, right? But it's hanging. So it's a bridge, there's an outside component and an inside component. 
and this is heating and cooling. And this is designed to get rid of those window air conditioners and put in this heat pump, which is an air conditioner and a heater. Just to be clear about that, if you have an air conditioner now, you have a heat pump. It's just a single direction heat pump. It only does air conditioning. You put in a heat pump, <laughs> um, it means it does both heating and cooling. So it's an air conditioner and it's a heater. And I'm just looking at the chat to see if there's anyone. Okay. You wanted to, Chris, Kristen, you wanted to know the link and the brand of the electric fireplace. Um, it's Optimist, Op, Optimist with an S, M Y S T. So Optimist. So this one, it's made by Dimplex. Um, D I M P L E X. Dimplex makes them. Optimist is the sub brand. And that's the, there we go. So then I'm going to show you some examples here. These are tiny homes, 14 of them for homeless veterans in Santa Rosa, just built a couple of years ago. So they're using those LG, the, the, the inverter ones, the through wall heat pumps. And LG is the only one that makes it with a computer. So I'm not talking about a MANA or any other brand. LG has a computer inverter one. So those are two grand total to install. You know, bought it, installed it, two grand. And then um, one of these sand ins is enough to provide heat, hot water for seven homes. These are Japanese products. They're designed for people who take a shower and then have a 150 gallon sitting tub that they fill. So sand ins, which are the only CO2 heat pumps we have in the US currently for the residential size, they're really, really oversized for American shower behavior. This is enough for an apartment complex, but that's what that's how you roll in Japan, is that you have an apartment complex's worth of hot water going into your sitting tub. So uh, seven of the apartments were hooked up to just one of these $10,000 install installations. They cost about five grand to buy, and then there's markup. And Okay, so these cute 26 little zero net energy homes for low-income seniors, um, these are using $3,500 installed. That's generally what you should be looking for. $4,500 if you're in a kind of an expensive urban area more if you're getting a bigger tank. And then these are ductless mini splits. So ductless means they don't have ducts. There's no duct work that connects one thing to another. These sit on the wall or they sit in the ceiling or they can sit in the floor, like floor registers. You can put them kind of anywhere, but they're just one place that's dumping heat or cool is the ductless part of it. So one fan coil on the wall with a compressor outside is about five grand Getting the second fan coil on the wall is another couple grand. That's how it goes. And every extra fan coil on the wall is another couple, three grand. And you have remote controls for them and each room is its own zone. So we found that to be less expensive than duct work. And here you can see why. So this is doing the same heating and cooling work. This is a duct work style heat pump, but it's $12,000, not 7,500 because there's duct work. This is the fan coil and you hook up ducts to this box up in your attic or below in the floor. And that extra duct work is what costs thousands of dollars more. It's just a lot of labor crawling around in a hot attic, hooking the, these things up right. Once again, this is a $3,500 per house installation. This, by the way, is the first tribal housing that the state has ever funded in California. Only in 2015 did the state finally start providing money to the tribal reservations even though they've been paying sales tax and da da da, you know, as whenever they left the reservation, even though they're real Californians that vote, it's the first time that they had access to uh, tax credits. So, ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps that heat water. So these are these are all heat pumps that are designed to heat water, so you can heat a floor, you can heat radiators, you could you know, make chilled beams if you're trying to do air conditioning and heating. You can do a fan coil, like just I was showing you a fan coil, sorry, here. You can hook up water to a fan coil and then blow air around in the house. Now ground sources are useful in Canada, but they're pretty much a bad idea in most of the lower 48 states because we just have too warm of an environment to need them anymore. Now we'd be using air source heat pumps, not ground source. So Arctic, Space Pack, Air Mac, and Chiltrex. Spacepack, Airmac, and Chiltrix are the three that are most available in California. Arctic, you'll find that it's a Canadian brand, but it's probably the best at cold climate performance. Like if you have a house up in Truckee, you want an Arctic. But anywhere else, Spacepack, Airmac, Chiltrix, they're great. And I just want you to know that there's no more expensive way to distribute heat than a radiant floor. If you would like to take your heating your house budget and triple it, 
put in a radiant floor, right? That's how you do it. But if you'd like to have your budget be something affordable, you get an air source heat pump and you heat air in the house. So that's the, that's the rules there. But assuming you do wanna do an air to water heat pump and you want it to be kind of on budget, then you don't heat the floor, which is the most expensive way to do it. You know, pouring an entire floor worth of radiator is more expensive than buying these radiators. And these are all radiators designed for heat pumps. Um, Yaga, J-A-G-A, -A, Yaga. These are all designed for the lower temperatures that heat pumps like to produce. Heat pumps don't like to make water hotter than 140 degrees. They certainly don't like to make it at 150 to 190, unless they're a CO2 heat pump, like the ones I was showing you from Japan. They like it. But most of the heat pumps we use in the United States don't. So these are radiators designed for that temperature regime, and this is how you do it. Yaga radiators or similar. Swimming pools. I love this swimming pool. I just swam at it yesterday. Um, this used to have to see these solar thermal panels. This is like $30,000 of solar thermal panels. It was replaced with this one right here, this $5,000 heat pump water heater. And this now heats the water in the winter time instead of the solar panels didn't, not in the winter. You really just can't do that in California, getting a, a hot pool in the winter time. But a heat pump can, because the heat pump is essentially a solar thermal collector, just collecting the heat the sunshine made in the air. So 5,000 bucks, and this is a glass covered swimming pool that has pineapples, bananas, sugar cane, and a rope swing. Oh yeah, that's where I take my kids to learn how to swim. Thank you, CJ, he's a leading local birder. So if you are trying to avoid a 100 amp panel, this is how you do it in concept. There's multiple paths. This is the technology version where you choose power efficient devices. So a condensing washer dryer, that's a combo product. This is from LG and this is the best one. I have it. Energy Foundation, a whole bunch of people I could list have this LG model, which is the best. Great washing machine, decent dryer, takes three hours, but it doesn't affect your power service to your house. The amount of power you need, this plugs into any outlet. Similarly, Ream is coming out this month with plug it into any outlet heat pump water heaters, retrofit ready, we call them. So like a thousand watts, 120 volt, meaning any outlet, any outlet in your house, you can plug this in without rewiring. So no service upgrade, no increase in power demand, just the existing power provided, provided your house. I showed you these earlier, the Innovas, also branded Efoca, means epic, Efoca, it's Italian. So fancy Italian heat pumps, these are also 120 volt, plug into any outlet in your house. And the mini split version of this exists too. There's actually a whole bunch of heat pumps out there that are 120 volt of different sizes that can plug into any outlet, meaning they don't use say more than 1400 watts. Sometimes 1800 watts is the limit. It depends upon the outlet if it has a 15 or a 20 amp circuit. And everything since 1962 has been required to be 20 amp circuits. So generally your the limit is 1800 watts. But anyway, here's these devices that you, it has no impact on your service upgrade. And that's it. I, was, I wanted to go through your heat pump options, how to avoid upgrades, you know, some basics around if you, you know, air to water, use those Yagas, some pricing, some examples. And if you have any questions, you're welcome to stick it into the chat. And I think I did my eight minutes there, or 12 minutes. <laughs> Here we go. Thank you so much, Sean. Wow, oh. I had no idea there were so many products. That was uh, quite an more. education. Thank I, you. I put into the chat um, the link to my booklet that we all wrote. So it's like 30 of us spent a long time. And this booklet is how to retrofit homes. So there's many pages on how to avoid service upgrades. And there's many pages on the different kinds of heat pumps and tons of pricing and examples. And so we try to make something that was for you, normal human beings on how to, how to heat pump up your house. So anyway, it's the links over there in the chat if you wanna read further. Thank you so much, Sean. That was amazing. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. And uh, now I know a lot more about heat pumps than I used to, thanks to you. Uh, our next speaker is Susan Gladwin, a climate advocate, investor, and entrepreneur who is co-founder and CEO of Ready, Set, Replace. She has worked in corporate high tech at Autodesk, leading initiatives to decarbonize the built environment globally. 
building on prior Silicon Valley experience at Apple, a former colleague of mine. She serves on several Marin County-based climate policy organizations and on the advisory board of electrification and climate tech startups. Susan is going to talk about how to electrify your water heating and how to plan ahead to quickly replace your old water heater when it breaks down. Take it away, Susan. Thank you, Fabrice. Let me get ready here. Here we go. Um, thanks so much. And thanks to the Green Change team, um, my fellow presenters, and all the folks in the audience. I know a lot of you are also working on different solutions. Um, some of our team is here as well. And of course, everybody who's just motivated to electrify. It's great. It's great to have you here. So um, I just realized that I'm on my last slide, not my first slide. So let me start over there. Okay. Great. So Ready, Set, Replace is indeed in the business of helping folks get ready to electrify and successfully see it through when it comes to our water heaters. And our, we want to make sure that every next water heater is climate friendly. So this can happen. Um, there's folks in our audience whose names I won't reveal, um, but pe you know, people do scramble to get that climate friendly water heater figured out when the gas water heater fails. Even, you know, Sean mentioned we're going to have these kind that can plug in. But for now, we don't. And even when we do, th those are going to be limited in terms of um, the size and range that they support for some time. So the bottom line is, like, like Mark also called out, we need to get ready in order to successfully electrify water heating. And that's the premise of what we're helping folks with. Why are we picking water heating in particular? Well, of course, we want to electrify the whole home. I mean, Brian gave a great outline of why that's important, uh, you know, all the, all the other aspects of this. And yes, that is our final destination. It is a major project. It is a major investment. Um, we, are, we are trying to help with something that we think will have a big impact that is less of a commitment up front, which is water heating. We talked about that being up to half of our home's emissions. So just that one thing can really make a lot of difference. You know, you heard some of the, it's just a little more do, to do when you figure out the, the space heating and cooling. Um, we can often get by without a panel upgrade, even for the, the um, units that are on the market today. You still may need an electric circuit, but you can get by without some of the bigger infrastructure upgrades. So, and finally, it's, it's just less emotional than a stove for most people, like who cares as long as you've got hot water. Um, so we wanna avoid this problem that you know, every day, thousands and thousands of gas water heaters are failing and getting replaced with gas. So gas goes to gas, it's a, it's a terrible moment to waste. We, that's, an, that's a huge opportunity, like I said, to take out about half of your emissions. And, you know, most of us are not going to be replacing gas water heaters until they do fail. And when they fail, it, like the picture shows, it's this leak, it, it's this emergency, it's a, it's a scramble, we got to get it out of there. Um, and we aren't equipped because, yes, today we can't plug them in as is um, necessarily. And it may not fit. You know, we talked a little bit about how they're a little bit bigger and so forth. So there's just some things to figure out. Some, some installations will be easier than others, but without making that plan, we end up falling into what Scott, who's a, who's a real person, <laughs> told me this story where he, he scrambled for several days and he couldn't do it and he had to get another gas one. And that I've talked to so many people that, that that's happened to. So what we're offering is to try to take the emergency out of the electrification, get ready, for that, we're calling this as a digital electrification service, um, making it easier for the homeowner, but also for the contractor who serves them. So we are helping guide people along the process, um, optimizing for the best, the best um, situation based on your particular custom needs as a homeowner. Um, and then on the contractor side, really, again, trying to take that emergency out because, you know, no, I, I know it's not a, it's, it, it can be, challenging for the contractor service person to try to come through in that emergency situation versus like let's organize and schedule out in time and because it's you know we can we can take our time but we can do it in a timely fashion so the way this works is this notion of ready set replace and what what we're doing for folks who sign up with us and i should say particularly in marin county that's where we're most focused a little bit around there as well we can look a little over to you know to our to our our south and east, but for folks here, we are doing a free assessment. It's custom. We're telling you how many emissions, what's the age of your gas water heater, how many emissions are going to be produced for the time that you keep it. If you 
choose to keep it around, um, what it can cost to upgrade, um, help you navigate those rebates. They do come and go. Um, help figure out the best type of unit for you and then ultimately the best contractors that are vetted who can help with it. We'll get this report to you as, as a homeowner. You can then decide, do you want to go for it yourself? You could. It's you know, it's, it's some doing, it takes some doing. Or the two other choices, do you, do, you wanna, do you wanna get ready to upgrade so that you can avoid the gas to gas? And this usually again means getting that circuit figured out, just dealing with all the things that you would need to do that would preclude you from successfully making that heat pump water heater upgrade in the future. So it's kind of like a small, a small job that prepares you for that, or just go for it. Um, and Christine came up with this great phrase of preemptive electrification, and that's that's just saying, hey, I can see there's, I can see how many emissions there are, I can see what it's going to cost me to do this, um, et cetera. You know, whatever motivates you to replace before failure, you can do that. So that's another option. But either way, you're going to end up with that heat pump water heater, which is which is ultimately our goal. Um, we can go to the next slide. So. The actions we can, we can take, one is individuals, um, show your interest by signing up with us. Even if you're not in the area that we're serving now, we're definitely going to be expanding. And we will be um, using also the fact that people are signing up from different areas to, as a way to figure out kind of where is the interest lying. Um, and also we want to, and we, in fact, we are working with our, some of our city governments. We've got, we've got agreement from two mayors in Marin County last week to work with us on a campaign um, to to help get people ready and replace pre-failure um, or at failure uh, through a water heating campaign that we're, we'll be running with them um, and that can support um, volume discounts and other ways of creating more funding for this type of thing too so it's it's we see it as definitely something that you can do as an individual but sort of a movement that we're we're in together um, and then of course this opens the, the door and the to future other electrification um, that we want to support and will be supporting in the future. Next slide just gives you the website again and then the last slide is is our closing which you can go to and thank you so much. Thank you so much Susan. I'm uh, really sorry that there was a little snafu here with the slides but uh, as I said we'll fix it in the video and we're also going to share the link to these slides with all of you uh, later in the call, it'll be in text chat, so you'll be able to go through those as well. And congratulations on this very uh, uh, helpful uh, new uh, project that you've started. It uh, takes a lot of the stress out of uh, electrifying your home, and, and I applaud you for doing it. Um, <clears throat> our next speaker is David Moeller with the Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad. David is a professional engineer with more than four decades of experience in the renewable electric power sector. He has an extensive background in regulatory and policy work at the local, state, and federal levels, and is skilled at strategy, project development, multi-party collaboration, complex transactions. A longtime community activist, David is helping Marin County and Marin Cities to develop jointly a uh, null electronic ordinance for new buildings. Uh, David will talk about how we can join forces to help pass all electric ordinances in our own cities and towns, taking collective action as his building electrification squad has done in Marin and Sonoma. Take it away, David. All right, well, thanks uh, very much, Fabrice, for the uh, introduction. Uh, as Fabrice said, I'm going to talk about practical tips to help you pass an all electric ordinance in your city. Uh, next slide, please. So first I'm gonna talk about why pass an all electric ordinance. Now, as we've heard throughout this presentation, climate science demands that we slash methane emissions. And it means among other things, we should run buildings on electricity only without burning natural gas. And as we've heard, especially for space and water heating. But additionally, policy action is needed to complement and extend the electrification actions by individuals like we've been talking about. This is because it'll be at least five years before regional or state policy will be in place to require that buildings be all electric. Local jurisdictions can act much more quickly than uh, the state by using ordinances 
which are the administrative tool that cities and counties use to enact local laws. An all electric ordinance requires that in addition to meeting state requirements, buildings in the jurisdictions must also be all electric. Now, these all electric ordinances are sometimes called reach codes, which you've probably heard of because they reach beyond state code requirements. Next slide, please. So why focus on new buildings first? Well, all electric ordinances can be written to apply to different categories of buildings. They can be written for new buildings, remodels, existing, or all three. They can also be written to cover single family residences, multifamily, and even commercial buildings. But the place to start is with new single and multifamily residences. The reason for this is because state requirements for additional housing are driving development of hundreds of thousands of new residences in California. And in Marin County alone, the Bay Area Regional Housing Needs Allocation, or RENA, I'm sure you've all heard of that, requires that local jurisdictions identify sites for more than 14,000 new residents, just residences just in Marin by 2030. Now, if these new residences have gas appliances, rather than decreasing greenhouse gas emissions, they will increase greenhouse gas emissions and lock in those increases for the next 20 to 30 years. There's simply no reason to connect new residences to gas because for new buildings, all electric is cheaper to build and cheaper to operate. The change to all electric buildings is underway now, and currently 45 California jurisdictions have already adopted all electric ordinances for new buildings, including locally Fairfax and San Anselmo. And as we heard at the beginning of the presentation, many more are in the process of developing and adopting all electric ordinances. Next slide, please. So what's going on in Marin? Well, earlier this year, the county began engaging all 11 of Marin's cities and towns in a process to develop a model all electric ordinance with the goal that all 12 jurisdictions, which would include the county, would adopt the same code effective January 1st, 2023. Now, totally independent of the county's initiative, the Marin Civil Grand Jury issued a report just in June recommending that the county, the cities and towns of Marin jointly develop a Marin countywide building electrification plan to address all categories of buildings. And each jurisdiction is required to respond to the report by September 6th. So the timing is perfect to leverage existing jurisdictional commitments to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, such as climate action plans and climate emergency resolutions, and the jurisdictions need to respond to the civil grand jury report to get all Marin jurisdictions to act on this. But we need to make sure that the model all electric ordinance that gets developed requires all new single and multifamily buildings to be all electric. And it should also require major remodels to meet some kind of energy point system that favors all electric. And we need to encourage the county and all of Marin's cities and towns to adopt this new ordinance when it's ready. Next slide, please. So what it looks like. Well, right now, citizens groups and organizations are reaching out to council members and their staff to build support for helping develop the model all electric ordinance and ultimately adopting that ordinance. And it's easy to do this when you know what to say and how to say it, and we can help with that. And as the slide notes, email and Zoom make outreach to your council members especially easy. Next slide, please. So what I wanna propose is that we do this together. The Marin Sonoma Building Electrification Squad, which is part of a Climate Reality Bay Area, is coordinating citizen and organization outreach to council members and supervisors in support of the model all electric ordinance. And we have identified green, what we're calling green code teams in each jurisdiction, and we're providing guidance to these green code teams and recommended talking points for advocates to use. And if you would like to join in this effort, I know many of the people of the call, uh, or the, the meetup here are already involved, but if you'd like to join this effort and aren't already involved, please contact me at david at maulers.us using the subject line green code team so I can sort it from all my other email. And this really is a great way, working on policy work, to extend your personal climate actions to the policy level. And I hope you'll step up and help make the all electric ordinance a countywide success. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. It's wonderful what you're doing. Uh, uh, taking collective action is such an effective way to uh, uh, influence our governments and, and businesses in our area 
to really make it easier for people uh, at all income levels to be able to electrify their homes. And, and I think that the way you're doing it is absolutely fantastic. And uh, I urge everybody to uh, give you a hand in, in the area where they live. Um, now, sadly, we have um, kind of uh, gone a little bit over time. So what I would like to do is, is have the Q&A continue in text chat, if it's all right with you guys. I see that uh, many of the uh, speakers have been responding. And, uh, you know, ask uh, any last questions you have for our speakers. Uh, maybe share some tips about how you are electrifying in your own lives and, and what actions you're considering and, 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 and what, what type of help we can provide. And we'll respond in, uh, in text chat. And I want to go straight to uh, the green tips section, uh, which uh, features green tips from our community. Bridget, do you want to tell us a little bit about the green tips that, that, we, that we have collected for electrification? First, we're, we have Al Grummet up, who I have followed a number of his tips, including buying a little induction stovetop plate. And he is going to talk today about uh, checking out your carbon footprint. Yeah, so um, basically uh, what we're recommending, if you're interested in a carbon footprint calculator, which is a great way to get an overview of your overall uh, carbon footprint, is to uh, check out the one at uh, coolclimate.org. It's a UC Berkeley calculator, uh, and you can find the link in the tip. Uh, but it helps you uh, sort out by category where your home uh, household's emissions are coming from. And what's nice about it is when you enter your zip code, it pre-populates the average in your area. So the starting point for the calculator is a reference point for you where you can uh, see how uh, people in your community uh, are faring on average. And then you, uh, it's very easy to enter all your information and have it uh, churn out uh, your footprint. And then finally on the last tab, it has a take action uh, set of uh, recommendations, many of which are, are referenced uh, in this talk today. So I encourage you to uh, check out coolclimate.org, the personal footprint calculator. Uh, that's a great first step in uh, figuring out how to reduce your carbon footprint. Thank you, Al. And the uh, link to uh, Al's tip, which includes the links to these resources, is included in text chat. Next. And Christine is going to share her tips on uh, small gas powered home things, a uh, leaf blower in particular. Yeah, well, so about leaf blowers, to my considerable surprise, I learned that if you drive like a big SUV like a, a Ford Raptor. <laughs> you, you have to drive it basically from one end of the country to another to the other, 3,900 miles to emit as much pollution as you get from a gas, power, gas powered leaf blower in about 30 minutes. They really are just dreadful for the environment. It's, in fact, it's one of the reasons why lawn care equipment in California creates more overall pollution than cars do in California which is just mind boggling if you think about it, especially when you consider, you know, there are a lot of alternatives and they're not, not such a hard reach. If it's just you with your property, you know, you might consider raking. Advantage of that is that there, it doesn't stir up as much of the dust, which has pollen, mold, animal feces, heavy metals, all kinds of stuff. Um, if you do a lot of leaf blowing, if you're more of a professional landscaper, you can move to an electric model, which doesn't have those emissions and um, the, makes just a huge difference. A number of cities have now passed ordinances um, ruling out uh, gas-powered leaf blowers. So people should be replacing them. Um, San Rafael just came up with one. I think they're going to be banned as of October 1st. So the thing for you to do is, you know, if you've got a, a gas-powered leaf blower, replace it with an electric one. If you have a landscaper, talk to them about their plan for replacing one. Some of these uh, cities and towns that have passed ordinances also have rebate programs for professional landscapers so that they can replace it without too much economic hardship for themselves. So get involved, you know, point out to your neighbors that they're now, you know, they're probably not going to be legal in your town for much longer if they still are. And just, you know, keep an ear out for them and, and be friendly about it, but start gently pushing people towards adopting electric or going for a rake because it really does make a huge difference to the environment, both in air quality, sound quality, and of course, um, emissions of uh, greenhouse gas. Thank you, Aunt Christine. And uh, this photograph is uh, of our gardener. 
whom I've been uh, encouraging for over a year to switch over uh, to an electric leaf blower. And here he is showing up his brand new model. Not only is he very proud of it, but he thinks it actually works better than his previous uh, model and it's incredibly quiet. And uh, uh, so sometimes just by talking to folks in your own life, you can actually make change happen. Well, and also Fabrice, I'd like to point out that for people who are breathing those emissions all the time, it's a huge health hazard, you know, for those of us who do it like an hour or a week or something, it's not so much, but a professional landscaper, the difference to their health could be considerable as well as the noise it makes and the whole, you know, there's a lot of impact on them. Cool. Can, can I just add that Novato is considering their leaf blower ordinance tomorrow night? I put something in the chat. And if anybody wants to work on this issue, you can uh, send a message to um, our team at, at, at uh, greenchange.net because I've been working on that. We'd like to collect names for, for we want to do more with this with this ordinance for sure. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, tip is from Bridget. Do you want to fill in since you were involved in that? Um, say a few words about the electric fireplace. And by the way, I want to give credit to Bridget Mazzini, who uh, edits all these green tips for your viewing and reading pleasure. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that Tom isn't here because he has this in uh, his home. He has one of these electric fireplaces, which were relatively easy to install. There's a couple, there's a number of different kinds. And you can have the sort of warmth and coziness of a a fireplace that's pretty realistic looking as this one is without all the gas emissions. I can't remember all the details of the tip, but um, he he's very happy with his. Cool, and uh, we also saw Sean Armstrong's uh, fireplace, which uh, he shared info about in the uh, in the text. So, so there's another way you can electrify your life. Um, next up we have Kevin Morrison. Are you gonna put the spotlight on yourself? <laughs> <laughs> and Kevin's going to tell us about his heat bump. Oh, that's too funny. Um, you know, the spotlight does work that way. I can add myself to, to talk to you. Um, Fabrice, the great thing about the heat pump is everybody has now seen how easy it is to do. I have a ductless mini split heat pump, which means that there's a little device outside, there's um, headers or air handlers inside each room that I that needs to be heated or cooled. And it's always worthwhile as we talk about this to remember saying a heat pump does air conditioning and it does heating. It's, it's so confusing, for, especially for people who are hearing the term for the first time. So we now and i'm calling you i'm calling you from novato we now have air conditioning which we never had before and on a day like today we're like yeah how do we live without this so it is one of those things where if you haven't followed along today in this uh, in this broadcast you'll be able to to look into our guides and figure out how to do this for yourself and do it economically i'm kind of annoyed by the way cuz honestly cuz we did this a couple couple years ago it's it's uh, it's much cheaper now. <laughs> well, Kevin, uh, you are inspiring uh, me and my wife to uh, get our own heat pump, along with all the other speakers who talked about that. And so we're taking bids now and uh, bracing ourselves for making that our next big major uh, home improvement. Uh, and and uh, I'm very grateful to you for leading the charge. If you click on the link that's in text chat, you actually will see a little video of Kevin taking you through his home and showing you how the heat pump works and, uh, and how he uses it in his own life. Um, and I think I'm the next uh, one to share a tip about a topic we haven't really talked about so much today, but it's uh, really a promising uh, technology uh, is to get a home battery. Uh, home batteries can save you money and time. They can protect you and the environment, um, they, can, uh, they don't pollute like gas generators. They're quieter, safer to operate, and they will power your essential appliances when you need them the most during power outages. And they can be re recharged with solar energy. So we have two uh, types of home batteries in our home. 
um, they come in different sizes. So we have on the left a mid-size uh, battery. It's a Yeti um, from Goal Zero. It's 1.5 kilowatt hour. Uh, and so this is a pretty handy, this is the first one we bought before we decided to go further. And it's, it's a fantastic little thing. You take it to where you need it. And it will not recharge your, your, it will not power your refrigerator, but it'll power a lot of other things. And then we bit the bullet and we got a large home battery, which you can see on the right. And we got it from SunPower. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a brand that's called SunVault. It provides 13 kilowatt hour, which is a lot more, and it will power the fridge and do it for several days. And it's charged directly by our solar panels. And although it's a, you know, it, it is a pricey uh, investment, just like the heat pump, uh, it is uh, really worth it. We we sail through power outages as if uh, there was no issue. And uh, it, 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 it's just fantastic. And we got this one rather than Tesla Powerwalls because Tesla Powerwalls use cobalt batteries and there's all sorts of issues with those. This one is a, a lithium ion phosphate battery. So it doesn't heat up as much as the cobalt batteries. And um, it provides more current and it, it, it has a longer shelf life. And uh, based on the research that we read, we thought that was the right way to go. But in any case, home batteries are definitely coming. Uh, and uh, consider starting maybe with a mid-size one if you're not quite ready to do the plunge. But they're absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think that's it for uh, the Green Tip section. Uh, I encourage you to visit our Green Tip uh, page on our website, greenchange.net slash tips. Uh, and if you have a tip that you'd like to share, contact us at team at greenchange.net. And uh, we'll be happy to, um, to, to help you uh, share your knowledge with the rest of our community. And we hope that everybody who, who just uh, attended this event will take action and we'll take a look at some of the, uh, the green change action guides that we've created. They're a little bit more in depth than these little tips, um, but we have tips on almost all of the topics that, uh, uh, that we've covered and we've got more in-depth guides on some key topics like uh, how to use uh, renewable electricity, how to get an EV, uh, how to electrify your home and uh, how to add solar panels to your, um, to your roof. So check them out. And um, I think that this is time to give a big thanks to our speakers, Brian, Sebastian, Annika, Mark, Sean, Susan, David, and all the tipsters who just shared their uh, knowledge. We really, really appreciate uh, all that you've done. Uh, many thanks to our team as well, uh, Al, Marilyn, uh, Bridget, Kevin, uh, Sarah are all here tonight, as well as Anne Christine. Uh, and uh, thanks to the partner organizations who make all this possible, from Electrify Now, MCE, Ride and Drive Clean, uh, Marin's uh, sustainability team, Redwood Energy, and uh, ready, set, replace, uh, as well as uh, the Marin Sonoma uh, County um, uh, Building Electrification Squad. Um, next steps. We invite you all to join more climate action events like that. It's a great way to get knowledge. It's a great way to connect with other community members who are doing it. And Marilyn Price, who just spoke earlier, is curating with Bridget Mazzini uh, this uh, green change calendar, which is chock full of events. Um, Greenchange.net slash calendar. Uh, go take a look. There are so many events. You could just be joining an event almost every day of the week, and they're really high quality. Um, also want to let you know about a couple more events coming up from Green Change. Uh, on September 12, we will be hosting a special meetup on saving democracy and the planet. Uh, we'll be announcing the speakers very soon, uh, but we'll also provide a lot of uh, helpful information on how you can join a phone bank or a text bank or help Canvas, uh, how you can support green leaders and how you can get politically involved in this critical midterm election. 
uh, you know, I think it is okay for us to put some of our green actions on pause for a while in order to make sure that we support uh, green leaders and green policies, because if we don't, and if democracy um, uh, were to uh, get seriously impacted, it impacts all of these climate action uh, policies that we, that we depend on. And so it is important for us to get involved politically, not just uh, take green actions in our own lives. And we hope that you'll join us. We'll email you through the Green Change newsletter to uh, give you more information about that. The other uh, project that we invite you to save the date for is Earth Day Marin, uh, which will be uh, April 23rd, 2023. You can sign up already if you want, so you can learn about the speakers and the uh, musicians and artists and all the exhibitors uh, who will be participating. It'll be at the Mill Valley Community Center, and it'll be... Uh, uh, as good, if not better, as the Earth 2050 event that we hosted last April, which was just amazing. Um, we had over a thousand visitors of all ages, uh, 50 plus exhibitors. Um, we uh, offered a wide range of options, exhibits, activities, arts. Uh, we worked with Ride and Drive Clean uh, uh, in order to provide an EV car show. Uh, music and speakers, and this combination of creative activities and great exhibitors made a, an incredible difference. Here are just some of the folks who were there. This is, here's Mark. Here's the Electric Car Show. Uh, here's uh, Make Your Own Art uh, activity uh, for people of all ages. Uh, some fine artists exhibited marvelous uh, artworks as well as young artists. And it was such an incredible way to all get connected through uh, fun games, music, uh, to give our speakers the spotlight. And we're gonna repeat that again, and we hope that you'll join us. And the link is in text chat if you want to uh, help out. And we could uh, actually use volunteers and anybody who wants to help organize or who would like to exhibit, now's the time to contact us. We're already planning that event in earnest. Um, if you use Facebook, we invite you to join us on Facebook um, and uh, by and large, join our network. You're going to be receiving our newsletters uh, going forward. And um, a big thank you to everyone for uh, for coming. And uh, I think I'm going to leave it at that now and uh, hope to see you at the next Green Change uh, meetup. And uh, thanks again for uh, uh, all of you who are leading the way. Uh, to help build a sustainable and more just uh, world for all of us. Good night.